Welcome everyone uh, to the session of the very first opening session of the Global Diaspora Summit, uh, the one which is uh, devoted to diaspora networks from data to engagement. Before we start our session, there is a one surprise to everyone who is joining us today. We will start with the welcoming videos of the International Organization for Migration and the Government of Ireland. So I'm asking everyone for a small patience to really listen to the video and then we'll move to the um, session. I'm just seeing that uh, there are questions in the chat about uh, audio. I will be with you moderating the session and provide all the information about its run up. So for now, feel free to be with us. Switch off your video for now because again, we're starting with the video the welcoming one, and we will reconnect um, after, after the introductory videos. Distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends, welcome to the Global Diaspora Summit 2022. IOM is so thrilled to co-host this unique event with the Government of Ireland, a country with a long-standing tradition and passion in connecting with its diaspora community, a vibrant Irish diaspora counting some 70 million people. The comprehensive approach to diaspora engagement of the Irish government fully resonates with IOM's vision. So why is this summit so important at this point in time? 10 years have passed since the last time diaspora and development ministers met in Geneva at the IOM, International Dialogue on Migration. And so much has happened that has highlighted the role diaspora plays as a key actor in shaping the international migration agenda. The most evident is certainly the adoption of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration. The GCM recognizes the importance of creating the space and the conditions for diaspora engagement and therefore provides a framework for action, a framework that will help building a lasting and trusting relationship rather than remembering engaging the diaspora for support only when it's needed. More. Diaspora plays a key role when it comes to representing a trusted voice in reaching out to migrants. And this includes, yes, sharing information on safe and legal migration opportunities and helping facilitate the access to these. But also, and very importantly, alerting them to the dangers of embarking on unsafe journeys, the risks of exploitation, trafficking and smuggling. This is not only an opportunity to save lives, it is a responsibility that we all bear. Diasporas have demonstrated a role during the COVID-19 pandemic, during which migrants were seen as those essential workers supplying the missing doctors and nurses or agricultural workers across the world. And diasporas are playing an essential role in the current Ukrainian crisis, not only by providing technical expertise. One example is IOM's Mental Health and Psychosocial Support Hotline, which now runs inside Ukraine thanks to Ukrainian psychologists in the diaspora, but also by engaging the diaspora of third country nationals in Ukraine who are not able to leave the country because they have no means to do so and are vulnerable. The virtual diaspora networks are the only ones able to reach these migrants, providing them information on how they can access help and in their language. So let's take advantage of our three days together to share experiences and lessons learned, but more importantly, to identify concrete ways to increase partnerships with the diaspora, to engage strategically in policy development, 
and the response on the ground. Let us make sure that the outcome document we are aiming for can bring the gist of our discussions and our commitments to the first International Migration Review Forum, which is only a few weeks away. It's truly a unique opportunity that we have to bring the migrants' voice into the IMRF. I wish us all a highly successful and productive summit, which we hope is the first of many more to come. Thank you. Falcherov, Gabalio, Clea, hello and welcome to Dublin. Ireland is proud to have been asked to host this Global Diaspora Summit of the Member States of the International Organisation for Migration. This is an important summit. It takes place against the tragic resurgence of conflict-driven migration and of growing environmental threats, particularly through climate change. In addressing these challenges, the global diaspora is a vital but overlooked source of support and know-how. Our diaspora are communities forged through hardship, both in their home and host countries. It's made them strong and resilient. They are communities that look to give back, to contribute to places that they and their family left, as well as the places where they have made their new home. Their stories and experiences are the connective tissue of humanity, crossing countries, cultures, and often generations. As we see today in the case of Ukraine, the global diaspora is providing vital humanitarian support and shelter to others forced to abandon their homes. I believe that this summit will strengthen the important contribution that our global diaspora can make to a more peaceful and prosperous world. And I wish you all the best in your deliberations over the coming days. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, participants of the first session of the Global Diaspora Summit, dear friends, everybody who is joining us today at this unique and historic venue when we are convening people across the world, those who really care about the connections evolving across societies, the diaspora communities who reside everywhere but still care about their place where they come from, their hometown, their village. Today is a great opportunity for us to celebrate this occasion, to really celebrate this, this connectivity. And the summit is officially being opened, the virtual element of it, with our session one, session about data and evidence. This is the one which is closely very close to my heart. My name is Marina Manke, and I'm going to moderate today's session uh, together with uh, uh, a number of very distinguished colleagues and partners who are joining me from different parts of the world to really share their experiences about working with diaspora communities, supporting human mobility, which is a really positive course for everyone and really sharing their views on how our work together can be more impactful, more efficient, because we want to zoom today into a very technical point, data, evidence, but that's the thing which is actually crucial to ensure that we have successful approaches. So let me first, as a host, say a very few words about um, the, some uh, house rules of this session. This session will be coming to an end promptly on time. So we have until 10.40 uh, GMT plus one Irish time with us. And we are going to really have lots of exciting discussions and dialogues. We have prepared some content. So, but my main point is really to everyone to try to be on time, respectful to each other, really abide by the rule of really diplomatic language and an engagement, and really uh, try to help us make the most and, uh, of, of this time that we are spending together. 
we are interacting in English during this panel, but at the bottom of, of your screen, you will be able to se select one of the six UN languages. And that's why I I'm also asking you to respect uh, the uh, work of our interpreters and not to talk too fast, but try to be distinct in your, in your speeches so that the interpreters also are capable of transforming and translating and helping us to communicate across different languages and realities. Uh, in addition to that, of course, it is a very interactive session. So we prepare the content which we want to share, but I'm kindly asking every one of you to respect the virtual reality of communication meaning one microphone switched on at a time so that to allow the speaker to transmit the audio and the sound in the best manner. And of course, we will be able to, to give you an opportunity also to switch on your microphone. It is an interactive session. So we have the speakers we have the panelists, but at the same time, we also are very interested in hearing from you, our dear audience, anything you want to share with us related to the subject. And for that, you feel free to engage in the chat and you're already doing that. I see that you're exchanging. Please do put your questions uh, into the chat. We will be monitoring those and I will try to do my best to ensure that we address each of the questions you're pl placing or at least tell you how we do that maybe later. Also, in addition to the chat, please, if you want to intervene verbally, as verbally, sorry, if you want to do that, please raise your hand. I hope everybody is aware about how to do that in Zoom. In the reactions uh, button, you just raise your hand and we'll monitor your interest in engaging. So, without spending more time on the on the uh, technical uh, environment, let us move to the content of the session. And again, I'm absolutely thrilled to have this opportunity to moderate the session, which is about diaspora networks from data to engagement. As I mentioned when I started the session, that data has been always my my uh, power, my my uh, my passion, uh, something what I have actually started working on in 2004 when I joined the International Organization for Migration. Since then, this has been really something which has been driving my attention in the context of working on human mobility and, and, and migration. And today we are placing the context of data management, evidence creation in the situation of a diaspora engagement in, in the context of working with transnational communities. Um, there's been a lot of initiatives happening around a diaspora um, uh, and how to better understand their composition, compositions, their, their characteristics. But at the same time, as we move forward, we also need to be aware about transformative changes happening in our societies. And I'm referring to the situation of digitalization, of abundance of new types of data, for instance, data available on internet, social media. And we will also speak today in the session a little bit about the experiences of extracting data from new non-traditional sources. But it's not about statistical methods. We have prepared today the content which is going way beyond the methodology, even though we will pay some attention to methodology, there will be a lot of attention to actually to the question, why and so what? Because one thing is to collect information and data, but another thing is how to use that data and information to become more impactful and more powerful in the objectives that we are setting. And today's objective is to, to do a better engagement uh, with transnational communities. So let me very briefly uh, tell you, our dear audience, about the run of this session. So we will have uh, uh, today, actually, this session is co-hosted by two governments, the government of Montenegro and the government of Armenia. And we have distinguished representatives of the two governments with us uh, who will start with the opening. They are the co-hosts of the session. Uh, afterwards, we have prepared a keynote uh, uh, speech uh, from our colleague who has been working with us. And to give you a little bit of teaser, this session is also special because it is launching the very brand new methodology and toolkit which IAM has developed on how to map 
diaspora and conduct diaspora studies. It's an exciting result of the work we've done over the uh, last couple of years. So uh, I'm sure our distinguished keynote speaker will speak about, will present that. We will then move to the uh, voice of the diaspora organization and I will um, say a few words before introducing the colleague there and then um, end up the session with interactive discussions. As I already announced, we want to hear from all of you. Okay, so without spending further time on the introduction, let me start moving to the panelists uh, who have joined us today. And the first uh, word and space in this today's session, I am giving to our uh, colleague from Montenegro. Um, this is uh, Milica Rad Radožitic, uh, uh, who is an independent advisor in the Diaspora Administration of Montenegro. Milica, it's a pleasure to have you with us today, and I'm really thrilled about your experience, uh, what, what, uh, what is uh, the bio which you shared with us. So it's really exciting to see all the efforts that the government of Montenegro has been doing, and you personally are contributing um, to that work. Um, so I'm really happy to see that uh, from your experience, you also, um, you know, are engaged in, in elaboration of, of a number of uh, um, initiatives that how to become more impactful in engaging with diaspora from Montenegro, and your experience also um, from um, from your your background is also quite exciting. So please, the floor is yours. Say a few words the way how you think. Uh, the work of your government is relevant, how this session specifically within the Global Diaspora Summit resonates uh, with you and everybody in Montenegro. Over to you, please. Thank you, Marina, for this great announcement. Well, dear participants, first of all, on behalf of the Diaspora Administration of Montenegro, allow me to warmly greet you. The relationship that every country, including Montenegro, has and is building with its diaspora is specific. It is a relationship based on emotion, but also needs and serious thinking on how to preserve the uniqueness and which projects to implement in order to unite the human, intellectual and economic potential in the country and the diaspora. The diaspora does not demand much, but at the same time expects much. The love they feel for the motherland will not be disturbed by unfulfilled expectations, especially not in the first generation. Unfortunately, the second, and in particular the third generation, is lost unless there is a strategically designed approach and specific projects for their connection or maintaining ties with the motherland. As the leading country in the region in terms of cooperation with its diaspora, Montenegro has raised this topic to the highest state priority and thus recognized the need for systematic regulation of this area on the model of highly migrant countries. Montenegro has undertaken the obligation to regulate the issue of cooperation with its diaspora through drafting a separate law. The law regulates uh, relations and the manner of cooperation with diaspora in accordance with the highest standards and the best practices of other countries. Since this was the first law that regulates this area, which was adopted in 2015, uh, solutions from comparative practice and experiences of highly migrant countries were used in its drafting, although the Montenegrin diaspora is far more complex and layered. Montenegro has long felt the need for as accurate data as possible on the number of our diaspora in the world. Montenegrin diaspora is scattered all over the world and its structure is heterogeneous, which further complicates the possibility of obtaining more accurate information about its number. In order to try to provide adequate answers to this complex question, the Aspera administration of Montenegro was given the obligation to keep records of our diaspora. Keeping records of immigrants and diaspora organizations allows us to know the structure of our diaspora, its number, intellectual, scientific, professional, and other potentials, concentration in individual countries and other specificities. The web application signed into Diaspora Register is one of the modes for implementing a sort of register of our emigrants, which through the structure of its questions and answers allows us to understand all the complexities of our diaspora. 
The availability of this data is extremely important from the point of view of planning the improvement of relations between the motherland and the diaspora, and better knowledge and processing of it can identify various resources of emigrant communities and their possible contribution to the development of the country of origin. It is interesting to note that this application is the result of cooperation between diaspora administration and Montenegrin diaspora that is based in North, North Macedonia, which connected us with the donor of the application. In order to create a modern database, we developed a special program for the registration of diaspora organizations a few years ago. We have also initiated the creation of separate databases on cultural, sports, health workers, and businessmen in diaspora, which contain all the necessary information about these emigrant groups, which facilitates further interaction with them. The databases, which are continuously updated and only accessible by the diaspora administration, enable active communication, exchange of ideas, project initiation, and networking. These databases are filled in by coordinated actions of competent bodies and institutions on the ground information possessed by our diplomatic and consular offices and information that can be obtained from associations and individuals from diaspora. What I want to emphasize in particular concerning the development projects of the state in terms of cooperation with diaspora are the programs within the Global Diaspora Development Network, which we initially launched last year. The idea that uh, is that through the project of the Global Diaspora Development Network, we form thematic clubs from all social areas through which we will connect all interested individuals, institutions, organizations from homeland and diaspora. So far, we have formed Diaspora Business and Science Club, which brings together successful and talented individuals around the world whose experience, knowledge, and contacts represent a huge and, and inexhaustible potential for our society as a whole. Given the size uh, of the Montenegrin diaspora, which is measured by a larger population than the one living in Montenegro, the main challenge is to establish direct communication with them. Unfortunately, our experience shows that most of the diaspora is not involved in the work of associations and organizations operating in the countries of residence, and this is expected given the physical distance of cities and states where they reside. Our focus is on building mobile platforms through which we will dominantly communicate with them. The need for continuous communication in order to have a real role and presence of the diaspora in Montenegrin society, but also our, our intention to establish this cooperation in direct contact with institutions, organizations, and individuals in the easiest and most effective way is a permanent imperative of the state. In addition to continuous communication, this project will enable cooperation between diaspora itself, which is another benefit of the active participation of diaspora in our programs. The rich experience of diaspora from developed and prosperous countries is invaluable to those of us who aspire to become so. The establishment of a narrowly profiled permanent body of diaspora is and linked uh, to institutions in the home country, as well as the organization of uh, gatherings and seminars, is certainly a prerequisite for a serious and constructive cooperation that can bring numerous benefits to society as a whole and the diaspora. By establishing such a system, we ensured a greater presence of diaspora and their families in the homeland which certainly means and the natural preservation of language, culture, and tradition, which we all strive for. The conclusion is that the key to successful cooperation and integration of all potentials of diaspora in the development of society, but also a strong connection between future generations, is the maximum commitment of the state to part of the building of these relations. This need is particularly pronounced in uh, countries that are in the phase of development 
and building a prosperous society based on the most developed countries in the world. And Montenegro has defined its strategy as a state project of national interest, treating the diaspora as a permanent strategic partner. In this regard, our current programs that we are implementing, especially especially the creation of uh, new ones in cooperation with diaspora, state institutions, local governments, but also all interested organizations and individuals, as well as through exchanging experience with partners from the region and around the world, are aimed at strong and continuous presence of our mm -hmm. diaspora in the development mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Sorry, Melissa, there was a participant uh, who, whose uh, audio was uh, was a little bit of introduction, but I think you can proceed. Oh, well, thank you. Marina, sorry, I finished. Oh, that was that was the end. You see, this is this was my plea to everybody who is. <laughs> No, there was a little bit of interaction, interruption, and again, uh, yes, indeed. Uh, no, thank you so much. This is again a, a, a request to everyone for us to be wary about your microphones. Please do not switch them on when when somebody is making. Thank you so much, Milica. So I was really listening very attentively, and I think some of the key messages what I'm hearing for me as a person who also has worked on 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 trying to make this diaspora engagement work uh, impactful. I really, uh, I, I think your your reference to unfulfilled expectations. This is something which we need to be very careful. And I think we will be continuously returning to that message throughout the whole summit, not only because of this data, not during this data session, because it's so important for us to indeed when we start engaging with diaspora, as you said, these are not necessarily structured, organized structures. These are individuals. They're having their own families, their, their work, uh, associations already elsewhere. So if we start engaging with them, so they want, they, they want to engage, but also they want to see commitment and, and really continuity. So the, the worst which can happen is that there is an initiative that we, we create those expectations not following up. So absolutely, uh, only uh, re, re, Recommit, uh, reconfirming that statement. Also, interestingly, your initiatives, what you referred to, the databases, going into specific professions or specific interest groups, so um, uh, and, and really engaging, targeting them. This is absolutely so important and crucial. And also tapping into the modern technology, you spoke about some applications, ways of collecting information. This is very, very rich experience. So thank you very much for your intervention and, and being the host of this very exciting session. So I would like to um, now turn over to our second co-host, the government of Armenia, represented by Nik Nicholas Devitian, uh, who is the advisor to the High Commission of Diaspora Affairs. If we could maybe look into the interpretation, I heard uh, Spanish, I thought. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, so, Nicholas uh, is... Um, uh, uh, is the, the advisor to the High Commissioner for Diaspora Affairs. And at the same time, he's engaged in, in conducting research with the Opal University. Um, as actually many of us on that panel also has a, a rich diaspora experience, experience of living abroad uh, until December 2020, based in, in he was based in Brussels, where he headed the European section of one of the world's main organizations serving the Armenian diaspora. So he actually engaged in diaspora work outside of the country, and now he is advising um, the government. So... Um, he has been working a lot on, uh, on issues of civil society and then uh, also has a rich experience of developing strategies, founded and directed a number of European civil, civil society networks. Nicholas, I think your experience is really very rich as well as uh, the work of the government of Armenia in the area of diaspora engagement is similarly very long-standing. So please, uh, the word is right now for you. We are listening very attentively. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Marina. Um, and uh, well, so th th we're uh, particularly grateful to the IOM and the government of Ireland for taking this initiative. Uh, and I look forward to the initiative of the summit, of course. 
Uh, and I look forward to learning a lot from this session and Milica's intervention in particular, reminding me, it reminded me of how much we have to uh, learn from one another and, and how much, um, how much these, how useful these exchanges are. Um, before I jump into the topic, I'd like to help you to situate Armenia, uh, for those who haven't been here yet, uh, and its diaspora and our institution, the Office of the High Commission for Diaspora Affairs. I will then, after that, say a few words on our experience with data and engagement and highlight some of the challenges uh, with, with, we are meeting or we have met. Uh, Armenia is a small mountainous country and it has pop, uh, some in the Caucasus, of course, uh, and it has a population of about 3 million people. Uh, but the number of Armenians living outside of Armenia is much larger. It's two or three times larger than the population of Armenia and is estimated around seven to 10 million people. So there you have it, data already. Um, the diaspora is spread on all continents, very much the way uh, Marina described the diaspora of uh, Montenegro. I'm sorry, Milica described the diaspora of Montenegro. Uh, we have Armenians in Russia and the post-Soviet space in the Middle East, in North Africa, Iran, the USA, Europe, the rest of the Americas, and in Australia. Um, another specificity of the Armenian diaspora is that it long predates the independence of the Republic of Armenia. And during the 70 years when Armenia, so the, the current Republic of Armenia, was part of the Soviet Union, Union, the diaspora was already very large, but it had little or no contact with the uh, with the republic with the then soviet republic of armenia uh, this contact was of course re-established when armenia became an independent country in 1991. so those are characteristics that are important to bear in mind uh, when looking at armenia's approach to diaspora engagement in the early days of the republic diaspora organizations and professionals provided substantial support to the country in many forms Though there was, of course, at, at that point, no policy for diaspora engagement. It just happened. People came. Um, over the years, uh, diaspora, uh, I should mention that because of the difficulties of the country since then, there has been a lot of emigration since 1991. So the diaspora has increased in numbers. Uh, over the years, diaspora engagement in Armenia has been substantial. Uh, for instance, the capital airport is run by an Armenian entrepreneur from Argentina. Uh, which is an example of diaspora-driven modernization and investment facilitation. Uh, Armenia's thriving wine industry uh, has been relaunched by diaspora Armenians from Italy, Switzerland, California, and Argentina. And it can now compete with the best, and I would encourage you to, uh, to try it, uh, to try its production, rather. Uh, and Armenia's IT industry is very much the creation of diaspora Armenians from the Silicon Valley and from other parts of the world. Now, in spite of these successes, Armenia remains a middle-income country, and uh, it, has far, it is far from having tapped the full potential of the diaspora. It is, therefore, our office's job to put policies in place to make the most of that potential. We have programs to facilitate repatriation and reintegration, to attract professionals from the diaspora to come and work in various ministries. We help repatriates from crisis in countries like Lebanon, Syria, and now the Ukraine, where half a million Armenians live. Uh, we stimulate the establishment in Armenia of diaspora startup entrepreneurs, and we also have a number of programs aimed at the youth and young adults uh, in the diaspora. Of course, good data is crucial in helping us design and implement all of these programs and producing results. But data must serve our strategy and its objectives. Uh, so when it comes to strategy, I'm not going to detail it here, that would take too long, but suffice it to say that it involves, among other things, maximizing repatriation to Armenia and also maximizing contributions to Armenia in the forms of businesses, investments, and also social and charity projects. So in designing a pathway under such headings, we must first design suitable indicator, and that is not an, a, as easy a job as it may sound. For instance, we know that every year about 10,000 people of Armenian origin request and obtain Armenian citizenship. But we do not have a figure for the number of returnees who already hold Armenian citizenship. 
and 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 but we know there are many we just don't know the exact number uh remittance remittances uh, on the other hand are a reasonably well known number uh, around two the two billion mark uh, and it's in, an increasing number and that makes up about five percent of armenia's gnp so it's an important part of its economy but the amount of inwind investment or charity projects from the diaspora uh on the other hand is uh uh, is not so easy to quantify, and I must confess, I, I don't think it has been quantified. Uh, <clears throat> finally, we also need to design indicators to measure the diaspora's contribution in terms of non-economic capital, that means uh, social and cultural capital. There again, we know it's substantial. The, the diaspora has a, coming from all over the world, makes an enormous contribution in connecting Armenia to the world and con contributing to its culture. Uh, but there too, we don't have indicators yet. So such indicators are important in order to measure the actual diaspora contribution in all aspects of a country's development um, and to, uh, to reinforce or correct, of course, policies. I hope that is clear from what I have said. Uh, and it is very much work in progress. Now, when it comes to measuring the uh, potential of the diaspora, um, so we, we measure the, the diaspora's impact, but we also want to measure its potential, how much uh, there is that we could mobilize or, or that it is, would be our job to mobilize. From this point of view, uh, there is a lot of research of the Armenian diaspora, but there are surprisingly few quantitative studies on the subject. Uh, the diaspora, it should be noted, is particularly hard to count uh, because it has been dispersed for a long time. Uh, the IOM, I have to, measure, uh, to mention here a study by the IOM. It's done a great job at trying to extract uh, people of Armenian background or information about people of Armenian background from big data sets. Uh, they have shown that such data can be exploited to identify not just geographical concentrations of Armenians, but also which organizations or, profession, or professions they are concentrated in. And using this data, we can help direct uh, our efforts for engagement towards particular localities or uh, economic or professional sectors. Uh, at another level, we've also started a major initiative in our, uh, at the Office of the High Commissioner to identify individual Armenian professionals around the world who could contribute to the country's development. We call this diaspora mapping. Uh, this work is still underway. Uh, of course, when it comes to individuals, the challenge will then be how to exploit this data, this information, and effectively reach out uh, to the right people and uh, help them to engage. Now, traditionally, our office has worked, so for many years, and before the Office of the High Commissioner, there was a ministry. So our office has worked with organizations or with key individuals who act as nodes in diaspora networks, diaspora organizations, are indeed essential in helping to reach out to diaspora communities, mobilizing and motivating them, and indeed in passing on an attachment to the country uh, for the, to the young generation. Uh, so we know quite a lot on this subject, but here again, the challenge is always keeping the information up to date. And uh, another challenge would be the quality of this information. How can we be sure that we are talking to the right people and the right organization, those with the greatest impact and the ability to mobilize the community. So there you have it. I've tried to sum up our experience as briefly as possible and would be very keen uh, to hear that of others. I'm particularly keen to learn from colleagues uh, and look forward to hearing um, Michela and Vartan, as well as the other participants uh, in the panel on this subject. And if, if I have a minute, I'd like to say, uh, to make a final comment in closing. Um, uh, I'd like to emphasize that diaspora is a complex formation, and it is therefore difficult to represent them in simple statistics. To make uh, a difference, quantitative data must be complemented also with a qualitative kind. We need to understand what drives the diaspora, how it views itself, and how we can motivate them uh, to contribute. And with that, I will close, and thank you very much for your attention. 
Thank you so much, Nicholas, um, both uh, um, for for speaking about the experience of, of collecting information and data, which is a recent one. Indeed, that was we consider it as a as a quite an innovation of the work we've done together when we looked into the ways of identifying uh, hubs or uh, areas where where diaspora uh, with specific background. I, I think we looked into scientific diaspora, so where they are residing. So really to to improve. Uh, the quality and, and, and effectiveness of engagement approaches. So, but also I, I really liked uh, the way how you presented your country. It's a beautiful one. I was there and indeed uh, every every place where you go to, you really, you sense that that the impact of diaspora and, and, and their uh, engagement, you mentioned uh, the airport, I think there are roads uh, constructed. So that's definitely um, a, a testimony to the importance of, of really us coming from the government side, from, from the societal side to really facilitate this engagement and really provide all the re important conditions and, and policies, laws, these are very important instruments to, to help uh, and, and, and all the all the mechanisms of, of information sharing. So exciting experience and, and uh, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, so of course, uh, some of the questions which, which you posed in terms of uh, quality of data, I liked your focus on the indicator, ind ind indeed. When we speak about data, what, what concretely are we interested in, in, in really measuring and learning? So these are very, very important um, questions. So, and I'm hoping that our next speaker, the keynote speaker, Mich Michele Vanore, has the answers to all of them. Well, maybe I'm overselling that because it's a very complex uh, topic, but uh, we've worked with Michaela for so many years and then indeed, uh, so I trust her judgment and every time when we speak about data on diaspora, we always keep on coming back to Michaela and the Maastricht University as a trustworthy partner who is engaging in multiple initiatives, uh, conducting those diaspora studies, working with different uh, organizations. So Michaela, uh, the floor is open for you. Please uh, convince us that that is an exciting uh, topic to, to, to look into when we speak about diaspora engagement and why is it so important to think about data and evidence. Over. Thank you very much, Marina. Thanks for the kind introduction. And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak with you to, together today. I have to say I was asked to give a creative uh, approach towards diaspora data. And that's a little bit intimidating, especially from an academic, but I'm going to do my best to inspire you. I'm going to share my screen with you. I hope that you'll bear with me a moment while I, I get the presentation set up. Uh, as Marina so kindly introduced to you, I am indeed a researcher based at the United Nations University Merit, which is a think tank based in the Netherlands that serves the United Nations system. And over the last decade in some, I've had the opportunity to work with policymakers and to work with governments on two sides both on designing diaspora engagement policies and on, let's say, responsibly translating science, data, and evidence into policy and into programming. Data is absolutely one of my great passions. But the other one is gardening. And I was actually really excited when I realized that I had the opportunity today to talk about my two great passions, data and botany, in the same subject. So like many gardeners, I struggle to know how much I need to intervene in the natural environment. And one of my great struggles is with the ubiquitous dandelion. I'm sure many of us know this plant quite well. It's one of the first flowers that emerges in the spring. It provides early flowers for bees, a very welcome pop of color, usually yellow and gray days. But it can also be quite difficult for us to know how to integrate into our natural plants. Of course, you'll also probably appreciate that the dandelion is a very potent symbol of the diaspora. And in fact, what you see on the screen is a very common image that we see when we talk about the diaspora. We see the seed head of a dandelion that's ended in these little cottony tufts that the wind can pick up and disperse and spread to all different corners of the world. I think it's quite valuable, actually, to talk about the dandelion as the symbol of diaspora. And I think it can be very instructive for us as policymakers, as policy advisors, as designers of diaspora engagement policies, to keep this visual metaphor in our thinking. 
gardeners, of course, have to decide how to uh, support the kind of land that they have to be productive in the long term. A gardener has a long-term strategic vision of what it wants to see emerge. And data is a really essential part of that long-term gardening strategy. You need to know fundamentally what grows and under what conditions certain plants thrive and certain plants don't. Our role as gardeners of the diaspora is not so dissimilar to that of a gardener in the natural world. We need data to understand who is in our diaspora, what kind of experiences they've held, what sources of identity they have, what motivates them, what constraints they face, and what resources they can contribute to development in both their countries of origin and their countries of residence. Like plants, some diasporas thrive on benign neglect. And one of the great challenges that we have as diaspora gardeners is to understand how we need to intervene to best cultivate the kind of environments that will help our diasporas grow and thrive. Sometimes our role isn't to provide direct growing supports, but to remove obstacles to growth. And what data can do for us fundamentally is to help us understand the nature of our diasporas, again, who's in it and what drives them, but also what conditions they need to grow and to thrive. As an academic, I also have the advantage that I can poke and prod a little bit and I can encourage us to think outside of our normal frames. This session was uh, framed as being about moving from data to sustainable diaspora engagement. And I would like to flip it around a little bit and suggest that it's very fruitful for us to conceive of data as a means to actually promote sustainable diaspora engagement. We can use data collection as a way to create structured, frequent opportunity for us to interact with the diaspora, to build up communication and trust that can of course inform better policy in the long term, but that can also give us the grounds for dialogue. As Mavena mentioned, I have had the great opportunity of being able to contribute to the Diaspora Mapping Toolkit, which is a recent resource that has been published just yesterday, actually, by the IOM. Part of the motivation behind the Diaspora Toolkit is recognizing that we are living in a world of overwhelming data. In almost all of the interactions that we engage in on a daily basis, we can be generating data that can be used to inform long-term diaspora engagement. We can imagine that, for example, the searches that we do online, the kind of news sources that we consume related to our countries of origin, can all be points of data that are informative about the diaspora experience. But the irony of this is that it's both easier and harder than ever before to actually use this data and part of the reasoning is that not all data is equal. We sometimes need assistance in discerning good quality, robust data. And we sometimes also need assistance in building up the systems and the tools to be able to generate that high quality, robust data. So the Diaspora Mapping Toolkit emerged a little bit from this vision that we can actually use the uh, data collection as a way to have a, a better connection with the diaspora. And we can also start collecting data more systematically using tools and procedures that can help us collect information over multiple periods of time and across different country contexts. So the Diaspora Mapping Toolkit is a resource that let's say is split into three different components. They can help users understand what can we achieve with diaspora data? What kind of steps and procedures do we need to follow if we want to meet those objectives? And what kind of tools can we use that help us create a systematic approach to data collection? One of the first components of the Diaspora Mapping Toolkit is what's called the step-by-step -step guide to diaspora mapping. And we can imagine the step-by-step -step guide a little bit like a, uh, an eagle's eye view of the different decisions that a commissioner, a designer, 
or an implementer of a diaspora mapping would need to make along the entire data collection and analysis process. The first component of the step-by-step -step guide advises users on how they can conceptualize the diaspora mapping. And it walks users through decisions that they need to make related to, for example, what kind of objectives a diaspora mapping can achieve, who or what exactly can and should be studied, and what kind of time span we might be thinking of when we're planning a diaspora mapping. The second component of the step-by-step -step guide relates more specifically to the decisions that we need to make about how exactly we collect data. It covers decisions related to methodologies and methods for diaspora studies. And it encourages users to consider what kind of methodologies are the most appropriate to collect data from the diaspora, given the particular nature of that diaspora, what we know about it in the past, and what kind of trusting relationship or not they have with the commissioners or the implementers of diaspora mappings. The section of the step-by-step -step guide also encourages users to consider what decisions they need to make about who studies the diaspora, what kind of roles and competencies are needed, for example, related to community mobilization and outreach. And it also encourages users to think about how they can maintain alignment between the different parts of the diaspora mapping, between objectives, tools, and so on. The final component of the step-by-step -step guide encourages users to consider how they will analyze results. Basically, what are the right ways of analyzing the data that they have collected? And how can they responsibly and in a nuanced way convey them the information, the insights that they've generated to the different beneficiaries or stakeholders of a diaspora mapping? The second component of the diaspora mapping toolkit tries to give very concrete tools to users in the form of indicators and specific questions that users can build into their diaspora mappings to collect more standardized and replicable data about the diaspora, again, over time and locations. There are two main sections related to these indicators and questions, which are split into what's called a core module and objective-specific modules. The core module of indicators and questions for diaspora mapping cover the basic questions we always have to ask to the diaspora in order for a diaspora mapping to be meaningful. So it relates to, for example, how a diaspora conceptualizes itself, how they define themselves and so on. The second component related to the objective specific modules provides indicators and questions related to different forms of diaspora capital. The first objective specific module relates to financial capital and provides example questions related to, for example, remittances, philanthropic contributions, transnational businesses. The second objective specific module relates to human capital, to the education, knowledge, competencies that the diaspora holds and may be able to invest in development initiatives in their countries of origin or residence. The third objective specific module relates to cultural capital, to the diaspora's sense of belonging and identity with different communities and locations. And the final objective specific module provides indicators and questions related to social capital, to transnational networks that diasporas may maintain. The indicators and questions provide alternatives to users that allows them to understand how they can collect data using either quantitative or qualitative methodologies. And a third component of the diaspora mapping toolkit provides users with greater guidance on how to use different methodologies. For example, surveys, interviews and focus groups, or even pre-existing secondary data, which can come in the form of big data, for example, Google Analytics data, or in the form of pre-existing statistical data. In the course of, the, of developing the Diaspora Mapping Toolkit, my colleagues and I had the opportunity to interview different experts who had been involved in commissioning or conducting diaspora mappings. And in discussing 
her experience of over 20 years with diaspora mappings, one of the experts that we talked to reflected and said, the diaspora are sick of being talked about. They want to be talked to. And implicitly, what she was talking about was the power of data collection and of data as providing us a structured form of interaction, of co-creation with the diaspora. As diaspora gardeners, I would like to, us, to encourage us to think about what role we need to take, how we can best cultivate the environments in which our diasporas grow and thrive. And for me, it all starts with responsible data. Thank you very much for listening. I hope that you found it useful and I really look forward to chatting further with you about this idea of diaspora data. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Michaela. Uh, I love this um, uh, association uh, metaphor with the gardening and uh, especially also attention to the uh, the flower we selected uh, of, as, as an image of, of the summit, but also, of course, it, it's, it's not us. It's, it's, it's really the image of diaspora engagement and it's really, um, really demonstrating uh, uh, the the complexities of, of, of uh, working in this area in, in, in really uh, engaging with diaspora because they are spread across the world and also they're all different, different uh, characteristics. And of course, uh, uh, if we come from a uh, perspective of researcher, uh, um, how do you structure the data collection so that really it, it, it makes sense? Um, uh, very interesting. And thank you for actually being the first one speaking and presenting the, the toolkit. We've worked so hard together. So that's the official launch of the toolkit and uh, everybody will find the possibility to, to see the link in the chat. Please do explore this toolkit. It's very big. It's many, many pages, but we hope that it's really the, the, the uh, quintessence of all the uh, uh, advice and then uh, practical suggestions that we have managed to collect based on the long-term experience of, of partners, but also our own organization conducted 150 different mappings across the world, and we tried to build upon that experience. When you spoke about the final uh, sentence, uh, diaspora doesn't want to be talked uh, about, but talked to. So our next speaker, um Vartan Marashlian is actually a representative of uh, uh, both a, per a person who used to be in diaspora, but now also returned back to Armenia and trying to, to do this meaningful engagement with diaspora community uh, within the, the repeat um, Armenia Foundation. Vartan, I'm very thrilled uh, uh, to have you uh, on this panel because, again, we are boring politicians and then international organizations. So what is crucial indeed uh, for us to, to in the end really do the, the work which which makes sense which in the end brings to concrete results on the ground so and i'm sure you have a lot of information and, and advice to give to us please the floor is to you thank you for the invitation i'll i'll put some fire in our discussion so let me share the screen first so i'm uh, i'm actually wearing not two but three hats because, uh, as Marina has mentioned, I was born in Armenia, spent most of my life outside of the country, was a part of developing of a young professional organizations and networks in the diaspora, then moved back, joined the Ministry of Diaspora in Armenia as a deputy minister for two and a half years, and the last 10 years working as, a, as the head of organization, co-founder and the head of organization, which primarily focuses physical move, repatriation of our compatriots for Armenia, but also diaspora's engagement. So on the picture you see, uh, I mean, it's not Armenia, it's Italy uh, and Venice, where Armenia has a strong uh, Catholic community. And this is the San Lazare Island in Venice, where the first Armenian book was printed in 1520. And uh, Nicola has already mentioned that we have a very diverse diaspora. Armenia is one of the oldest diasporas. Uh, because uh, we had different waves of diaspora starting from medieval century. So basically we have victim diaspora, labor diaspora, business diaspora, and imperial diaspora. So from that point of view, with, we have a lot of do's and don'ts that might be useful for other countries who are establishing relations with new emerging diasporas, especially don'ts, by the way. So I'm more than happy to share with those don'ts, but definitely not, not now. All of them will be introduced. So in terms of data outreach, we have a lot of challenges. So one of them is basically the fact that 7 million people live in more than 100 countries. We have new and traditional communities, diaspora communities. 
In terms of religion, we have a big uh, diversity. Most of them are followers of the Armenian Apostolic Church, but also other uh, religions or branches of Christianity as well. We have different traditional parties, political. In the diaspora, only one is presented in Armenia, two dialects, two orthography. And this is very important because for many diasporas, this will become a problem later. We have a big number of only English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Russian-speaking people. So basically, in terms of communication, you won't be able to reach them in any other language rather than that one which they actually they know. Uh, we have 30,000 organizations and networks worldwide, more than 1,000 diaspora schools, 200 churches, 200 media, diaspora media. But one of the biggest challenges is that diaspora is becoming more and more deconcentrated, decentralized, and all of those organizations and networks cover less than 30% of our diaspora. So the outreach is one of the biggest challenges. Armenian identity is becoming much more complex and not only, only about, and not only Armenian identity, but basically we now have people who have two, three, four identities. And this is a new reality that different states and nations need to face with. And unfortunately, we still have a big number of Armenians in the diaspora who have never visited the country. So talking about repent Armenia, why our case might be also interesting is because we are basically a small organization, foundation, NGO, with five staff members uh, with a budget less than $200,000 per year. But we've been able to manage uh, quite substantial and significant results in terms of outreach, in terms of building uh, our community in, in country. So we have 12,000 members of Armenian repatriates community in place. We process more than 800 applications for repatriation and integration. We have a big outreach in two languages, in Russian and English, because these are the two most spoken languages by our diaspora. Uh, so content developed about repatriation, diaspora's engagement as a good outreach. Uh, we organized a big number of forums in the diaspora, engaging many people. And especially after the COVID, the online content becomes much more important. So we also managed to, to have good results there as well. So uh, on the picture, you can see one of our Imagine Armenia forums in Boston at MIT, and also our team creating a Lebanese Armenians moving to Armenia with our special employment support program. So in terms of diaspora's engagement, I think it's very important why do we want to collect information, the data, because it's not about the data, it's about people. We always need to remember about this. And if we look at diaspora's engagement, in general, there are three levels of engagement. The, the first lead below is tourism, remittances, and charity. This is the block which is kind of a low risk, but also low impact. And it's, or it's commonly used, uh, this type of engagement is commonly used almost by all nations who have diaspora. The second, which is more complicated, is social and participation of diaspora in social and business initiatives, in investments and expert promotion, in innovations and skill transfer. So this is a medium risk for the diaspora, but also as a medium level of impact on the country's development. And the highest level and the most difficult ones, the most challenging ones, is using diaspora, collaborating with diaspora would be better to say, in lobbying uh, of these country's interest and also in increasing its international influence. It's engaging diaspora in institutional development and also in organizing repatriation, physical move of people to the country. So with all of those elements which should be developed, and definitely they shouldn't be developed by the state only. So this is a very important thing which is common for everyone, and I hear it all of the time, is the problem of trust. The trust is a very important element of relations between diaspora and state, which is very easy to lose, but very difficult to develop and keep taking into consideration how diverse the diaspora is and their perception of the country might be. But in order to get there, you really need to be ready as a country to uh, delegate political and economic power to the diaspora. There are many ways and we won't go into details here. It's very important to align your agenda and priorities with the diaspora. It's very important to develop the right an optimal institutional framework of both public and private institutions working with the diaspora. And it's very important to create an effective outreach strategy.
So the more difficult task you want to target as a country, as a nation, a more complicated and more sophisticated way of diaspora's engagement and outreach you should follow. So basically the chain would be the following. So you start with the outreach, right? The second is data collection. The third is the communication, because without data collection, uh, without communication, data collection becomes just a passive tool. And if you don't communicate with people and say, why do you need this data? They really become frustrated. The fourth is engagement. You need to suggest some engagement based on the data that you've collected. If you just collect the data, it's a big problem. And the fifth is impact assessment and introduction of impact to the diaspora so that more and more people get motivated and then you again go back to the outreach element. Uh, I've tried to analyze the institutional framework because I think this is also important, how actually the most efficiently uh, the country can and, and the diaspora institution can uh, work in diaspora state relations. So here there are five types of institutions and their strong and weak sides are also introduced here by uh, the level of impact, by sustainability, the level of adaptability to new uh, realities, by professionalism of their staff, by diaspora's advocacy, so basically how much they introduce the agenda of the diaspora, by an ability to outreach the diaspora, by an ability to collect the data and process the data, by the ability to effectively engage diasporans, and finally, the trust, right? You can see that the analysis shows that all of those institutions have strong and weak sides. This doesn't mean that the country should select only one institution that should lead. It basically, it means that effective synergy and collaboration between different part, type of organizations can bring to a much better and much sustainable result. So basically, if public institutions are not very strong in terms of be, having professionals in their team, they definitely need to look and create public-private partnerships, right? Uh, if, if, if you want to have a bigger outreach, you definitely need to have a collaboration of public and private institutions uh, and, and, and so on and so, so forth. So, and here on this picture, finally, you see Armenia. This is uh, Armenia's capital, Yerevan and the Mount Ararat, which is the symbol of Armenians. Uh, and of the diaspora as well. So several recommendations, which might sound a little bit general, but I think this is important to mention. So state diaspora relations is a two-way road. It's always important to remember this. In, even if you develop something extremely nice and good, efficient as a program and introduce the diaspora, the program as something which has been already developed, most probably they won't buy it. So you need to have them engaged as soon as possible. The second is very important to match the priorities of the state and the diaspora. Some of the priorities are common, but some of them are different. First, concentrate on those which are common. The third is building trust. Emotional intelligence, listening is extremely important and empathy skills are also very important. Repet Armenia's, one of the reasons that Repet Armenia is successful is because four out of five our uh, members are actually repatriates from different countries. And when we establish a dialogue with repatriates, potential repatriates, we create trust very quickly. And communication goes in the right direction. We speak more than six languages, two Armenian dialects, and this really creates the trust atmosphere, trust atmosphere very quickly. Um, you need to engage diasporans and their institutions in policy development and decision making. This is also extremely important. Uh, as a state, you really need to understand what you are ready to give in order to have more effective diaspora engagement. This is a type of an investment process where you also need to invest from your side. You also need to give from your side in order to have diasporas, diaspora, engage, diaspora engaged. Don't think that you are unique. Learn from others. I think this, uh, this is something which I came uh, to this uh, understanding several years ago when I met 50 representatives of different diasporas in one of the conferences and one was astonished by the fact how similar are like 80% of challenges and problems that we are thinking of. So in 20% cases, these are different, but in general, there are a lot of similarities and there is a lot of things which we can learn from each other. And you also need always to challenge yourself, think out of the box. This is an important element for the development. If, if you're a public institution or a private institution working with the diaspora. And the last one is 
especially important for those nations who have an emerging diaspora today. Support your migrant today to engage him when he or she becomes a successful diaspora. Thank you. I'll stop here and we'll be more than happy to interact with you and answer the questions. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Vartan. Uh, it's a very comprehensive vision and approach based on, I am sure, a very, very extensive experience and uh, uh, both in the context of more successful engagement and, and strategies of doing that, but also reference to the data. What, what I noticed in your presentation that when we speak about data, we actually might mean different things. And when you spoke about also numbers of organizations um, and numbers of schools, these are also indicators which we spoke about and, and, and uh, referenced. So because the, 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 the topic is so comprehensive and complex so that the types of data and ways of collecting it also would differ and depending on the on on the on the objective but but i really liked your 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 uh, also message on saying that yes we need to be concrete we need to also engage and and really uh work with diaspora um and and also uh, there are specific moments of time when it's important to engage because again uh, as we usually refer to diaspora is the first generation second generation we do not necessarily speak about third generation because third generation people already kind of becoming so much in, in, incorporated and included into the societies that sometimes these ties to their motherland might, might be becoming weaker. So I think there's this opportunity to engage. So I do have uh, a few questions from the chat. Thank you, everyone who is engaging. I also have a challenge because the next sessions, two sessions are starting in seven minutes. So um, because of the content that we prepared was so rich, uh, um, but let us try to do our best to ensure at least that we look into the questions which have been uh, posted into the chat as I requested. And specifically, Vartan, if you don't uh, go away, and that would I would like you um, uh, to maybe answer this question. Um, and specifically, it's about uh, uh, the question from Elvina. What do we mean when we speak about co-creating with diaspora? These are words. But can you get maybe one concrete example of co-creation with diaspora? Cooperation with diaspora. Co-creation. Uh, co co-creation. Co-creation, uh, yeah. So I think uh, it's very important that uh, initiatives are developed both by the state and the diaspora. So basically, if the state has its own, uh, its own uh, programs, which it's promoting outside, it should also promote private programs which are in place. So giving a possibility for private diaspora organizations to use outreach abilities of the state in order to attract more people and having more effective diaspora engagement experience with the country is one of the examples. Uh, it can be through created creation of a combined programs where programs are co-financed by the state and the diaspora institutions. Uh, so yeah, it can be uh, through uh, increasing the number of participants uh, and uh, actually increasing the capacity of diaspora institutions to develop and expand their programs. So I, I, will, I will stop here because we have a little time. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So doing together, indeed, if we have an initiative so that really, rather than sitting in, in the cabinet and thinking, I think this is we engage up front, you know, so really. Yeah, talk, the biggest you know, challenge is everyone is trying to think through the narrow corporate interests or understanding. Mm -hmm. And it's extremely important to take them out of that comfort zone. Those of the government, especially those institutions which are established, are reluctant to change. Those who have a sustainability in terms of financing are reluctant to change. Here, where there should be a certain dialogue between those institutions where everyone can contribute to each other. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So let me uh, use the space and interactive uh, uh, remaining minutes to, to, to really bring a, our colleague from the audience, Nvatan Pavka from Nigeria. So we do have some uh, questions in the chat and, and I'll try to really address, but uh, Nvatan, do you want to uh, unmute your microphone and feel free to also switch on your video? You have a question or comment? I just have a comment to yes, make. Yes, please. Uh, I just wanted to latch on to what the speakers have said. Um, especially um, regarding the importance of data, which is a springboard for basically what governments do. For us in Nigeria, 
Data has helped us to identify that there are over 17 million Nigerians in diaspora, which has also helped to influence some policies. Um, one of the policies that was um, that, that this influence was the um, um, central bank policy, where remittances are now received in the currencies which they were were sent in the first place. It has also helped us in the sense that we organize um, annual diaspora investment summits. It's also um, helped to, to also establish a diaspora investment trust fund. I mean, if we didn't have this data in place in the first place, it wouldn't have been such a strong springboard to have so much of this um, diaspora engagement. I know we, we, we don't have a lot of time, but there's, there's, you know, there's more to share. Even the diaspora policy itself, was also established based on the numbers of, of you know, the need for, to, for more engagement. Yeah, in that. So that will just be my little contribution today since we have no time. I'm so sorry, Matan. That's a very important contribution. And of course, the experience of Nigeria is absolutely relevant. Uh, yes, we have prepared a very rich program uh, for the summit. So this is the first day. Um, and then I would wish to have a bit more time. Actually, the topic deserves um, a full day of discussions uh, and not only presentations. We did try to do the bird's eye type of flight over the experiences of governments as well as, you know, uh, the, the tool which we, are, we have just specifically prepared for the summit and launched. And, and of course, the experience of, of each country is so valuable. And it's great to know that in, in your country, you, you really took it very seriously uh, to, to really understand the numbers. How many? Does it make sense? And which countries to engage? Great. Um, I'm really, really struggling right now to finish. I have only two minutes but I have a list of questions and I just want to give due uh, uh, attention to those. So our audience was asking us also about, for instance, being more specific about what we, what we mean under, um, you know, uh, human or cultural capital and how do we look into, into the data collection there. Uh, Asanga spoke about that. So this is really, I advocate to look into the toolkit. So it has a separate uh, chapter uh, specifically explaining on the indicators, what we mean under that. So human cultural capital, of course, they are general notions, but I think hope that that would help you. Um, the, the, the role of research, how academic research contributed to political strategies. So what are the potential for, and barriers for collaborating um, uh, between the, uh, the, the the data and then the governments. So I think uh, that's also a question uh, from Akale. I, I would have loved asking each of you, but again, we ran out of time. I'm so sorry. I was a bad moderator, I believe. Uh, so uh, then uh, the the uh, slides, yes, and and access to uh, to the toolkit, to the recordings. We will make sure these are made available to you so that you can listen back to all the rich presentations, contents we have put together. Um, um, online conferencing, uh, yes, about the, that, that's a good, good idea, Muligete, in terms of doing the promotion of the toolkit. After the summit, we will see whether we will be able to do that. Um, yes, that was actually everything that I could have managed to do because we were asked to, to finish sharp on time. I'm thanking everybody, especially our co-hosts, Milica and Nicholas, governments of Armenia and Montenegro. I'm thanking everyone who joins, uh, joined us today. And uh, I would like to uh, welcome you to all the other sessions during today, which are starting now. So we have a session on diaspora philanthropy, a session three on diaspora's diversity, inclusion and belonging longing framework, that could be the one uh, to actually list, uh, go to if you're interested in the cultural capital and, and the social capital. So thanking everyone, my panelists, uh, I ran out of time to give you each a possibility to say the final concluding uh, word. And also the, all the support team behind uh, the AT colleagues, the interpreters, I hope we were not too fast and you managed to work with us. I wish you all successful end of the week, the beginning of the summit, and looking forward to meeting you at other sessions today, the first day, as well as Monday and Tuesday for the ministerial segment. All the best to you. Stay healthy, stay safe, and stay in touch. Bye-bye. Thanks, Maria. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, colleagues.